Okay. Gabriel, uh, do you want me on camera when All I right. speak? It's up to you. Um, yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll do All a right. little intro. All right, y'all, welcome. Welcome to another just, Earth. Can you just um, show mine? If not, that's okay. I can be the voice in the cloud. I'm happy to be the voice in the, voice in the cloud. All right. Thank you. Please go, Gabriel. All right, y'all. Welcome to another Earth Day every day. Do you want uh, me to today get started? We have Sam, and uh, I'll just pass it over to Sam and let him introduce Hello, the rest. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Judy Schmidt with the City of Dallas and the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to be here with the Dallas Public Library, and uh, they're our partner in these virtual programs. Uh, without them, they would not be possible. I guess it's your go, Sam. Okay, that's a clean segue. Um, I like sure. that. Oh, Sam, what do you think? Okay, um, so I didn't hear all of that, but that's okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. My name is Sam Kieschnick. I'm an urban wildlife biologist with Texas right. Parks and Wildlife. Um, and we're going to be talking about some really interesting stuff today. Um, I'm actually not going to be the one presenting. I have the very wonderful privilege of introducing our intern. We were lucky to have an intern with Dallas, uh, with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Dallas Fort Worth Urban Biology Office, and her name is Grace Millsap. Uh, Grace is, I believe, a junior at uh, West Texas A&M. Um, I've had a lot of fun getting to know Grace, getting to know more about Grace, getting to spend some time out in the field with Grace. As urban wildlife biologists, our field is in the city. So we study all of the different things that are living in the city, that are found throughout the city, and how these things are impacted by our actions. So uh, today, Grace is gonna be talking about how litter impacts wildlife. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you're having any technical issues, you can put them in the chat if you're able to. Uh, save those questions till the end of the presentation and Grace will hopefully be able to address them. I'll be monitoring the chat, so if you have questions, put them in the chat um, and we can ask them to Grace at the end. So I'm gonna sort of uh, hand it off to Grace right now. Grace, are you ready? I am ready to go. All right, awesome. Grace, go for it. So hello, my name is Grace Millsap. I am a student at West Texas A&M University. And today I will be talking about how litter impacts wildlife. Um, where I go to school, it's not super, super urban yet. I'm from DFW, so noticing the impact of litter here is definitely more than what I experience out at school. Um, and it's really important to know how litter infects the, it affects our wildlife and, uh, more importantly, what we can do to mitigate those effects. So let's talk about that. So first of all, I think it's important to um, define what exactly is litter because there is still some misunderstanding on what exactly defines litter and what um, what 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 kind of debris and waste actually qualifies. So let's go over the definitions. So litter is any waste product that is not properly disposed of. That can mean plastic, foam, paper, metal, food. If it was made by humans and it's not properly thrown away, it's litter. And um, 
that for, well, we'll get into this later in the presentation, but for some more specific definitions, um, when we get into macroplastics and microplastics, um, macroplastics are what you see in the image below. Those are plastic items with a diameter greater than or equal to five millimeters. Those are the ones that you can usually see with the naked eye. And they're the ones that, you know, whenever people think of litter, that's what usually what people usually think of. Microplastics are items with a diameter less than five millimeters. And we'll get into the impact of those a little later. So let's go over some of the most common types of litter. Um, obviously what you see in the picture, aluminum cans, plastic water bottles, paper cups, um, like food packaging. It looks like there's an egg carton back there. Um, uh, there's, there's tons of different kinds of litter, but the most common types are chewing gum, cigarettes, paper products, and single use plastics. Um, paper products can be confusing because most people associate those as biodegradable litter. Um, people think that if you leave them out in the environment, they'll eventually break down and they will, and they'll, they'll return to the environment. But since they are so heavily processed, it's usually, um, they, they usually contain things that if they break down into the environment, it is not safe for those, like those, those chemicals and those products to be in the environment. For single use plastics, water and soda bottles, grocery bags, cutlery, coffee cups. We all use single use plastics. I'm just as guilty. They're just so convenient. And we will go into, um, into those later in the presentation and how we can reduce our use of those because by reducing those, we also help reduce litter and the impact of those single use plastics on wildlife. So two types of litter that um, we will also get into briefly is human food and pet poop. Again, these are considered biodegradable litter. Um, not many people realize that they actually have pretty um, severe impacts on wildlife and the normal behaviors of wildlife. Human food, especially um, if you have um, organic litter or trash that has been removed from your trash can either by wind or if a raccoon got into it because it wasn't secure. Animals can eat that and um, it can make them very sick or if it's exposed to the environment long term, it can have bacteria, not good. Pet poop, kind of the same way. People will leave it on trails or in parks. And the main problem with that is that pets carry a lot of bacteria and um, they, they carry a lot of pathogens that should not be exposed to wildlife. And as we all know, dogs will eat other dogs poop. So it's not uncommon for animals to eat the, pet, the poop of pets and it's, it, that, that is considered litter and it can make wildlife very sick. And of course at the bottom, biodegradability does not dictate what is and isn't considered litter. So let's talk about the immortality of pollution. And this is, this is one of the reasons why it is so harmful for wildlife because tons of like types of plastic pollution last forever. They, a lot of the pollution that we create will outlive us. Um, as for chewing gum, up to 1000 years for it to decompose depending on where it is deposited. Um, cigarette filters, 500 to 1000 years. Fishing line, 600 years. You will get into the, the the dangers of fishing gear. And the fact that it takes that long to decompose is crazy considering the amount of damage it causes to wildlife. And you, you can see this whole list of plastic and metal products that take years to decompose if we do not properly recycle them or dispose of them. Um, the litter we leave behind will almost always outlive us. So it is very important that we properly dispose of it in order to keep us and wildlife safe. So let's, let's just look at this image. Where have you seen litter? I know that I certainly have seen it pretty much, pretty much everywhere at this point. I've seen it in DFW. I just went to Colorado the, a couple months ago and I saw it in a state park. It's everywhere. It's basically inescapable, which is you, you have some people who think, well, I mean, if litter is everywhere, is there really any point in dealing with it or doing anything about it, which that is the, it's the wrong mindset to have because our litter can harm wildlife even like if there's so much of it, it seems overwhelming to us. So it is still important for us to be conscious of that even if this image is kind of overwhelming and it looks like litter outnumbers us at this point. 
but um, it's it's still important for us to be conscious of its effects on wildlife and ways that we can reduce the amount that we create. So why does litter happen? Um, there are two primary reasons that litter occurs, at least from what, from what I found. The first and absolutely most common is litter is accidental. Most people either do not realize that they're littering or they don't understand what constitutes the definition of littering. So like we were talking about earlier, organic litter is kind of a gray area for a lot of people. Um, they don't realize that the, the harm that it can do to wildlife and how it can collect microbes and all these dangerous pathogens that can hurt wildlife and it's, it's still considered litter. Um, and like to some of the examples, trash falling out of garbage trucks, or if you have loose trash in a bed of a truck, I've seen that way too many times where stuff has flown out of a truck bed when I'm on a highway. And usually the people who are driving that truck have no idea. They have no idea that, that, that they just littered. It's most of the time it's completely by accident, which I mean, why it's, that's why it's important for us to, um, take measures to reduce those accidents and um, know when those accidents are prone to happen. Um, and number two, eh, some people just don't care. And this presentation is for the people who do care. And all of you I know do care, that's why you're here. And um, we're going to focus on ways that, um, that litter can harm wildlife and how we can keep that from happening. So the, the people who don't care, that's that's a whole different that's a whole different group. <laughs> so I took this image in Rockport, and it is a long-billed curlew. Um, can you identify what is wrong with this poor bird? So it has a hook in the bed in like the pad of its foot and fishing line wrapped around its leg. As we talked about earlier, fishing line is one of arguably, in my opinion, one of the most dangerous kinds of litter because it is specifically designed to catch things. And if it is improperly disposed of, it's going to keep catching things. And um, luckily for this long-billed curlew, it was still walking around and foraging. And it was, um, the, the, the fishing line was not caught on an area of its body where it would impede its, um, its feeding or its flight directly. But this is not the case for many other animals. Um, hundreds of seabirds and wading birds are killed each and every year by discarded fishing gear, either getting it caught around their necks or their wings so they can't fly, or um, for most seabirds, they have very adapted bills like this long-girl curlew. They have very, very long bills. It is easy for fishing line and other types of fishing gear to get caught around those bills, and that can make it very hard or impossible for birds to eat and they starve. Um, and for cetaceans, that's whales and dolphins and porpoises. Um, discarded fishing gear and nets kill about 300,000 of them each year. And um, that can either be by getting caught in it or that can be from accidentally ingesting it. Um, litter affects all wildlife, uh, both terrestrial and marine. Um, our, the, the, the litter that we create affects every kind of wildlife in one way or another. So let's get into those effects. Um, there are def there are way more than five effects, but these are probably five of the most crucial and ones that we can do something about. Um, for the first one, polluting the soil and water, um, litter, if left long enough in the environment, um, can like leach stuff into the soil and water that can make wildlife sick. Um, wildlife can get sick from organic litter consumption. We'll get into organic litter some more. <laughs> We've talked about it a lot already, but it's a big deal. Um, the, the litter can cause physical damage to wildlife like that long-billed curlew. It can create microplastics over, over years, like you end up with the macroplastics and then they become the microplastics later on. And the wildlife can ingest that and that's, that's bioaccumulation and all that stuff that we'll get into. And most importantly, it can desensitize wildlife to human spaces. Um, if trash is not secured, wildlife can get into it. That creates litter. And that associates your trash um, with food for wildlife. So we'll, um, we'll get into that too. 
But as for as many ways as there are for litter to harm or kill wildlife, there are just as many, if not more, and there are ways to prevent it. Um, and we will go over all of those, all, all the easy and most, um, most accessible ways for you to prevent litter from harming wildlife. These are things that you can do in your everyday life. Um, and it's just doing a little bit of this every single day, I mean, makes a major impact on the wildlife in your community. So first we'll get into soil and water pollution. So over time, litter can become a breeding ground for microbes. And depending on the type of microbe that is growing on this litter or living on this litter or feeding off of it, um, if the wildlife consumes it, it can make them ill. Um, that's mostly for organic litter, but it can also be for inorganic. Um, litter that is made of plastics or foam or metal or treated, like the metal that's treated with chemicals or wood that's treated with chemicals, all of those chemicals can be leached into the environment over time, depending on how long that litter exists in the environment. And this is especially bad for fish and amphibians and aquatic macroinvertebrates that are especially susceptible to this kind of pollution from litter. Amphibians, uh, just to highlight them, they're one of the most endangered groups of vertebrates, specifically because of pollution and water pollution, because their skin is so permeable. And um, limiting the amount of litter that is in our waterways and in our soil helps them a lot because they are so delicate. Um, organic litter that is left in water or soil can accumulate dangerous fungi and bacteria. We will get into that more. <laughs> So, so first, some preventative measures for keeping wildlife safe from pursuit from polluted soil and water. Um, obviously, adhere to litter laws and hazardous waste laws. Um, that's that's the easiest way to do it. Make sure that you properly dispose of litter um, in an area where it's not going to easily get into water or soil. Um, and if you can pick up litter when it's safe to do so, go ahead. But just make sure it's safe. You don't want to just like, well, we'll get into lit into um, litter safety guideline guidelines, but um, if you can pick it up, I mean, please do. Um, obviously, we'll get into this more, but please don't feed waterfowl and ducks such as ducks and geese. Um, I, <laughs> I like to go to Trinity Park during the winter to go check out the, um, the migratory birds that are there. And I swear every single year, there are people feeding them bread and there is bread just floating in the water. And that can cause a ton of problems down the way for those birds, like illness and disease. Um, so feeding wildlife both directly and indirectly can have dire consequences for both you and the wildlife. Um, for wildlife, consuming organic litter can cause sickness, choking, death, indigestion, malnourishment. It can do all kinds of harmful things to them. And um, wildlife have very specialized diets. Um, and if you feed ducks bread or other human foods, or if you feed any wildlife human food, that can make them sick. And um, for, for, for feeding ducks and geese, especially like at places like Trinity Park, um, if the bread is just left floating in the water, it can collect those microbes again, because those, those, those microbes will feed on that bread. And depending what kind of bacteria um, you have or fungi you have hanging out on that bread, if a bird or a duck eats it, that can make them very ill. Um, yeah, feeding, fe feeding wildlife in general, not advised. For a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. <laughs> um, so ways that you can keep wildlife safe and healthy um, from illness and disease, um, you can properly dispose of organic litter in a lidded trash can. I specify lidded because in this case with organic litter, um, wildlife can smell that. And that's the smell of food is going to bring a lot of things in. And um, if your trash can is not lidded, that just means that they can crawl right in there, throw the trash around, take out whatever they want and get sick. So when you have a secure lid on your trash can, that keeps wildlife from getting into the trash and keeps them from getting sick. Um, if you are eating outside, like if you're having a picnic or um, a party and you're eating food, make sure you bring a trash bag with you. Um, this means that you can pick up all of that organic litter before you leave, all the napkins, everything. And that means that you're not leaving anything behind for the wildlife um, to accidentally eat, thinking that it's food. Um, 
like it doesn't it doesn't even have to be organic per se like if you leave a napkin out there that has food on it um, an animal could eat that and it can make them sick or they could choke on it so taking all the litter that was created at this picnic or party is going to keep wildlife safe um if you're in a, again if you're in a safe position to pick up organic litter do so obviously what can make wildlife sick can also make you sick so wear the proper protection we'll get into like i said we'll get into those precautions so injuries and mortality back to the curlew um this is probably one of the um costs of litter that people are most familiar with we've all seen the sea turtle with a straw stuck up its nose litter can do a lot of damage to wildlife and it's trapping an entanglement is just one of them but they can also ingest it they can choke on it um if they're like if we were talking about cetaceans earlier most of the cetaceans are not deliberately eating like litter like if they're filter feeders um they will just simply swallow it and yeah, then they've swallowed litter it's they, they can do a lot of internal and external damage so some of the most um, dangerous kinds of litter are the ones that have rings on them or ways for, or other ways for wildlife to either get their limbs stuck or their heads stuck or um, just a way for them to accidentally um, get like a part of them stuck in the litter. And fishing line is one of them. Metal wiring is one of them. Plastic soda rings, like the stuff that's on cans or Gatorade. Um, wildlife will get their their heads or their like their their body stuck in that, and over time, as they grow, it will constrict them. Cans and bottles, um, if like if you can have like squirrels or rodents accidentally get their heads stuck in cans if they're trying to get food, and they 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 may never get out of it, and that can that can kill them. Um, and the for litter can get caught on limbs and tails and necks and this can cause blood flow loss or suffocation or it can like cause a change in their natural behaviors um like like luckily for this curlew it was stuck on a part of it that it was able to still forage but for a lot of animals that's not the case like that that can um cause an interference with their natural behavior so preventative measures, there's a lot of ways to keep wildlife safe on this front. Obviously, number one, I'm gonna sound like a broken record by the end of this, but properly dispose of trash by placing it in a secure trash can or by recycling it. Um, for fishing line and other kinds of fishing gear, there are more steps to properly disposing of that, but considering how long it exists in the environment, roughly 600 years, I think it's pretty important that we all follow those steps. Um, just to make sure that we are not hurting wildlife. Um, if you like, if you ever buy those um, those like aluminum cans of soda and you have those plastic soda rings, um, you can always cut those before disposing of it. Um, and I'll like, we'll, I'll show you all how like I do that um, in the next slide. But crushing aluminum soda cans can help um, make sure that wildlife are not getting their heads stuck in it. If you're in a safe safe position to collect any litter, again, please do. So this is what I mean when I say cutting up those um, those soda can like rings, just to make sure that it's not a full ring anymore. So that once you cut it, there's no way that, a, that an animal is going to get its head stuck in that. And then after you cut it, you properly dispose of it. Or if you find litter that's one of these rings, you can pick it up, cut it, and then properly dispose of it. So fishing line. Um, this is actually not as hard as some people think it is. Um, it's it, the, the very first step, just cut the fishing line into six to 12 inch segments. If you can't recycle it, this is kind of the last step. Just put it in a lidded container before you throw it away. Cutting it into these little segments, make sure that no animal is going to get tangled in it. And um, if they're not gonna get any limbs stuck and um, that overall you have just made um, a huge leap in keeping wildlife safer from fishing line by cutting it into smaller segments. Um, but if you can recycle it, um, it is highly recommended that you do. Um, if, you, if you do go fishing and you want to throw away your fishing line, there are tons of ways to recycle your fishing line and properly dispose of it. At, you can dispose of it at bait shops or marinas or tackle stores or, fish, or popular fishing spots. Um, in areas where um, fishermen are like 
known to go, usually the city will provide a way for you to properly dispose of that fishing line. Uh, to your right is one of those, um, those disposal tubes. Um, I've seen these at uh, pretty much every marina I've ever been to. Um, and obviously no other trash. This is just purely for fishing line. Um, but this is one of the best ways to make sure that your fishing line is properly recycled. If you're able to cut it up beforehand, um, please do before you put it in there. Um, and to the left, that's, please don't wad up fishing line and just throw it away. <laughs> that is a good way for, even if you're properly throwing it away. Like if, you, you're, if, you're, if you're throwing it in the trash can, instead of just leaving it at the marina, there's a chance that that could end up as litter someday, even if you didn't make it litter and then wildlife could get trapped in it. So always cut it up, if nothing else. So on to probably one of the most complex ones. There's not too much we can do about microplastics like directly, but we can do stuff about mac macroplastics. So um, I don't know if y'all have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, it's right over, um, the, the, over the North Pacific gyre. And this is basically where in, in, in areas of the ocean where litter has accumulated, um, either by, unfortunately, there are still some countries that dump trash into the ocean, that's one way, or if it gets blown into the water, or if there was a party on a beach and somehow that trash ends up washed into the ocean. Um, these, this, this top, um, like it's not, it's not an actual satellite picture, but this is from NASA and where they have documented trash in the ocean. And you can see where they overlap with these gyres. So you end up with trash in the ocean and it just kind of circulates forever. And that is one of the ways that microplastics have been created. So microplastics are created after plastic, macroplastic has been exposed to sun and wind and water for long periods of time. Um, this could take this this could take months to years, depending on the type of plastic or foam, um, and also depending on the location. Um, and microplastics um, can have a variety of negative effects on wildlife if they are consumed. They can disrupt hormones, reproduction, and growth. They can also release harmful chemicals that can inhibit action by the animal's immune system. Um, and one of the one of the major dangers of microplastics to wildlife is bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is, um, as an example, so let's say some fish um, all, all consume microplastics in their diet. And those microplastics do not, they don't get excreted. They stay in the fish. And let's say an eagle feeds on just the fish that have consumed microplastics. That is its main area where it, where it um, catches, where it gets its prey, is this one spot with all these fish who have um, accumulated those microplastics. And those, they can bioaccumulate in that eagle and eventually make that eagle sick. Um, that is one of the major threats when it comes to microplastics to wildlife. Um, and obviously, um, the long-term effects of microplastics on wildlife, as well as humans, is not well understood. So what that means is the less microplastics we create, the better, because we already know, um, just based on what we, what we do know about microplastics, that consuming them can't be good. <laughs> so let's get into the, um, uh, the, the this, is, this is a graph basically explaining bioaccumulation. Um, and um, obviously the, the microbes can colonize a fragment of plastic. A fish can accidentally consume those microplastics. Obviously it's not on purpose. They can either be accidentally consuming it with other prey or if their prey has already consumed microplastics, then they now have the microplastics. And obviously in this image, humans are the ones consuming the fish, but this is um, usually not the case. Most of the time it's wildlife consuming wild fish and they too can accumulate those microplastics. Um, so one of the main ways that we can prevent the, um, the production of microplastics is making sure that we are properly disposing of litter and um, making sure that we recycle it and making sure that it's, it's not getting into our waterways. And um, that's, that's the first line of defense for um, preventing the creation of microplastics. So, Last but not least, the habituation of wildlife. 
Um, so habituation means when animals become used to being around humans or are no longer afraid of humans. Um, unsecured trash and litter is a major way for wildlife to be comfortable around humans. And not only that, but if the if if you leave trash unsecured for long periods of time, that can actually teach the animal that that is a source of food for them, and they will associate your trash can as a food source they should keep coming back to. Um, this can lead to unnatural and potentially dangerous behaviors, depending on the type of animal that your trash is attracting. So the best way to keep um, wildlife from getting like get getting hurt from us or from litter is obviously not feeding it. Like I said, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, not feeding wildlife directly or indirectly, making sure that our litter in our trash is properly disposed of where wildlife cannot access it, especially the organic litter. Um, and that also prevents the wildlife from getting too used to us and getting into spaces where they could be unsafe. Um, and obviously picking up litter where you see it um, and if it's safe to do so, please do. Um, and probably one of the best ways to um, keep litter from being created is making sure that your trash is secured. Um, if it's not secured, that means that the animals can get into it and um, possibly potentially throw it around, have a, like raccoons getting into your trash, having a little trash party, throwing it around. You don't want that. You want your trash to be secured so that the raccoons are not accidentally cre creating litter from your trash. <laughs> These are um, probably the least expensive measures you can take to make sure your trash isn't secured. Um, uh, the right image, you can buy that bungee cord, um, like securing strap on Walmart. It, like it's 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 on walmart.com they're really easy to um to put together or you could just get a bungee cord and just tie it down to your trash to make sure that no animals are getting into it so that um either your trash doesn't um oh, yeah um so that animals don't get into your trash um and don't accidentally make litter or if just to make sure that if you have a windy day that your trash doesn't get blown over and you accidentally create litter that way like i said most litter is created purely by accident, but there are ways for us to um, to reduce those accidents from happening. It just takes no, knowing what to do in order to prevent them. And this is one of the ways. So we've already talked about um, a bunch of different ways that um, we can reduce the impact of litter on wildlife, um, but there are, there are even more ways. And these are all fairly easy to do um, not everybody can participate in all of them, um, but there's always at least one or two that you can participate in. And some of them are even pretty fun. So um, I kept saying that we would go over litter safety. So before we get into any of, the, any of these other um, any of these other, other topics, let's first talk about um, if you're gonna go pick up litter, what you need to know. So if you're under 18, always ask a parent or guardian before for permission before picking up litter. Um, some of this stuff can be dangerous and um, you'll want to know what is safe and what isn't safe to pick up. Um, and always use gloves and wash and sanitize your hands after picking up litter. Um, what can make wildlife sick can also make you sick, potentially. So you don't wanna take those risks. Um, it, your, your health is is also important as the wildlife self. So make sure that you keep your health in mind. Um, don't pick up dangerous items. If it's sharp, if it's dead, if it held chemicals at one point, don't pick it up. <laughs> it's unfortunate that it's litter, but that kind of stuff is, um, is potentially very dangerous to pick up and it's not worth risking your health to pick it up. Um, wear closed toed shoes that protects you from stepping on anything that might be sharp or dangerous, like what we talked about earlier. Um, if, if you're collecting along roadsides, be sure to face oncoming traffic and also wear brightly colored or reflective clothing if you're collecting along roadsides. So let's get into the other ways um, that you can help reduce litter just before it even becomes litter. Here are some ways that you can reduce it in order to help wildlife. So reducing single-use plastics. We talked about single-use plastics earlier. Um, we, they are absolutely everywhere. 
Um, you get them at fast food places, you get them at Walmart, they're used at parties. Um, some of them you use every, in everyday life. And um, like I was saying earlier, for most of the single use plastics that exists, you can find a reusable alternative. Um, and this means that you're reducing the amount of waste you create, which also means that you're reducing the amount of potential litter that can, that can be created. So for every plastic grocery bag, there is a reusable grocery bag. Um, reusable water bottles, um, we, we all know about reusable water bottles and they're so much cooler than plastic water bottles because you can do, you, you can be like me and cover them with stickers. You can personalize them. So reusable water bottles, um, if nothing else, that is a great way to reduce single use plastic usage. Um, metal straws, um, reusable plastic plates and bowls. The plates don't even have to be ceramic or metal. Um, there are plastic plates that can be used for years that um, are affordable and you don't have you don't have to throw them away every time you use a new one. Um, buying juice and other drinks in bulk instead of in individual packages. Um, or you can even buy the powdered form of those drinks and um, they're just just ways to use less plastic when you're um, purchasing these items. Um, recycling. So where I grew up, recycling um, was not very convenient. It was not very available. And that's still true um, for many parts of the world and even DFW today. Um, but if you um, would like to try recycling, um, most cities do offer um, like recycling locations on their website or guides to how to recycle. Um, so we have two links for Guide to Recycling in Fort Worth and Recycling in Dallas. And um, you can also find one for um, more specific cities. I'm sure there's one for Arlington or Plano. Um, there's for, for most major cities nowadays, they have a recycling guide. Um, but some benefits of recycling that help out our wildlife, um, for one, we're conserving natural resources. And um, another one is it reduces the, um, the amount of raw materials that we have to extract for new products. And um, that means that there's less habitat destruction. That means that we're creating less waste that could end up as litter later. Um, recycling overall, um, if, you're, if, if you're able to do it, if you're in, a, in an area that um, offers recycling locations, that, that is a great option to help keep litter out of our cities. And last but not least, this one's where I was talking about some of these options being fun. This is the fun one, engaging with your community. So um, y'all have probably heard the Trinity Trash Bash. That is a really good way for you to get out there and collect trash with other like-minded people because there's a lot of people in cities who um, who would like to collect trash, but don't feel safe doing it on their own. When you do it with your community, that means you're doing it with somebody who has um, the, the experience, you're in a safe group, and you're also doing something great for your wildlife and the environment. Um, these are all more sources um, for ways that you can engage with your community um, and help clean up um, litter out of our cities. And um, by doing these things, um, we're making sure that we're making a safe place for us and our wildlife. And that's all that I've got. If you have any questions, um, uh, I'm here to answer. I might not know all of them, but I'll do my best. Thank you all. <laughs> We have uh, one question for you so far. What do you think of bird feeders with species of appropriate food? Um, for bird feeders, um, the major issue there is if bird seed falls onto the ground because that's similar with the um, with bio with uh, um, with organic litter. Once it gets onto the ground, it can collect bacteria or attract animals that you don't want. Um, uh, with I feel like bird feeders are usually fine as long as um, it stays on the bird feeder. Once it becomes, once it's on the ground, that becomes litter, and that can attract animals and rodents, and that can teach um, other animals that are not birds to come to your feeder or your house. Um, and just making sure that you clean up the seed off of the ground if you have a bird feeder. That's that's that 
that usually helps the keep that's it's not litter if it's off the ground, at least from what I understand. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question I see in the chat. If we do see an animal being wrapped in litter, are we able to untangle them safely or would that impact them even more? Um, it depends on the animal. Um, from, I, I've, from what I understand, if it's like a bird or anything like that, you're better off reporting it to um, a game warden or to a um, rehabber. Um, it's because um, for those of us who aren't game wardens or rehabbers or biologists, um, we don't really have the, like the, the, the knowledge or the experience needed to hold on to a bird or to safely take off the litter. And as much I've I've seen animals with litter on them and it's it hurts it hurts to see that. But at the same time, I know that I don't have the experience or the qualifications to take that litter off of them. So your best bet is to find a rehabber or a place um, to report that animal to and have a professional come out there and take it off of them. Like I said earlier, it's not worth risking your safety or your health, or I mean, even trying to take the litter off of the wildlife yourself can also put the wildlife in a stressful situation or even kill them depending on what type of animal it is. So you're always best off finding a professional in your area who can take it off for you. All right, um, if no one has any other questions, I think we'll uh, wrap this up. Thanks everyone again for joining along and uh, thanks Grace for leading a wonderful presentation. Thank you all. All right, have a good rest of your day.